Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, Ken. You look great as always. Great shape. Uh, everything, your hair looks, every piece is in place. And I want to start by saying to the Marathon Boys, which you're one of them, congratulations to the other one, our producer, Rob Moore. Uh, he won a... He won another, you guys, does anyone else win marathons <laughs> besides you and him? He won a marathon, I, what was it, Saturday? Um, uh, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, yesterday, Sunday morning. Uh, I mean, really, seriously, do you do you guys got like, uh, what do you call it on that thing that, you know, uh, you own? Monopoly. Uh, yeah, really, you own it. You own it. Well, explain to the people what he won because uh, yeah. it's impressive. Rob is like, uh, to, to everyone who knows this, Rob is like my brother. When it comes to running, if there is any one person that I would ever be okay with someone beating me, it would be Rob, although I would never, ever let anyone win. And you he, would never uh, talk to him again. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Let's be honest. That's it. We try to be, uh, we, we pride ourselves on this show seriously as being honest. Yeah. So you would never yeah. talk to him again, but you, you'd you still do the show. But go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I, don't have any, I, I don't have a healthier competition with anyone other than Rob. He won the Surf City Marathon in um, Huntington Beach, California yesterday. We did that race together two years ago. I came in second. Rob was third or fourth. This year, he went back and blew the doors off everyone. I think he won by five or seven minutes. He ran 232. The, the levels at which he's improved wow. is just incredible. Is I'm incredible. so incredibly proud of him. That's Rob Moore, M-O-H-R, for the running fans out there. It's just, I'm so happy for him. I know how much it takes to win a marathon, and it is so incredibly rewarding when you do get to win one. It's just, man, I'm happy for him. And How many, uh, how many people in that race? How many people in that race? few thousand. Wow. few thousand. Wow. It's a big race. Wow. The multiple waves. Yeah, big one. Wow, that's, that's tremendous. It. Well... I wanted to make sure we got that mentioned. Congratulations to Rob. Um, he's yeah. he's he's um he's he's not running now, is he? He's he's. he's <laughs> I think he's. I think he took a day off. Here, but right? knowing him, he probably did a few miles to recover this morning. Yeah, I'm sure. The, I'm sure. <laughs> um, you know, we uh, real quick mention of since we're into sports, uh, obviously all overall. Uh, the Super Bowl. Who do you like? I'm. I'm gonna say there's something magical going on with that young quarterback in Cincinnati. I. I just sometimes magic is in the air. I think there might yep. be a little magic in the air with this kid, and I'm gonna say the Bengals might claw uh, the Rams uh, with with this kid. I mean, I, I understand the Rams. What are they? Four point favorite, four and a half point favorite. Yeah, uh, somewhere at home. Yeah, at, at home, home. That's incredible. And that's look, you're, nice. you're right away the quarterback at home. You you know, there's a story with this quarterback. He's been in the league with a bad team with Detroit so many years. Finally, it's his year. Uh, that happened for Tampa Bay with uh, with Brady for, with Tampa Bay when he left the Bengals. And then where does he go? He goes to Tampa Bay. Where's the Super Bowl? It's in Florida. It's I mean. Uh, the whole thing was storybook. It was like Hollywood written. And this has a little, you know, this this has a little touch of that too with this quarterback, you know, for the Rams um, where Stafford, where it, it could, you could see that. You could you could see that this this is his time. He, you know, he comes to the Rams the first year, boom. Uh, they're, they're in L.A. for the Super Bowl. And he gets, you know, he gets paid back for all those years with a bad team. Uh, but then again, the fly in the ointment, the fly in the ointment, you know, just like Rob's a fly in your ointment <laughs> within the marathon, you know, <laughs> a little bit, you know. And the fly in the ointment, baby, uh, it just might be Joe Burrow. What's your feeling, Nick? I, I couldn't agree more. I think... I from a personal perspective, I don't think anyone can lose for me because Stafford, he's paid his dues. I mean, he was with the doormat Detroit Lions and he was so good, but with the team and the organization was so bad. 
that it's highlighted by how, I mean, he now, look, he went to a really good team and their defense is just insane. Uh, Aaron Donald, I mean, this guy, you need to triple team him on every play, but this, I, I, I'd love to see Joe Burrows get it done. I mean, that would be such an awesome story. I don't think Cincinnati's ever won a Super Bowl. You know, L.A., I mean, look, I loved living in L.A., but their fans are like a bit fair weather. They're very transient. I was lucky enough to go to the Rams-San Francisco game last week, sat in the box with some execs from the 49ers, and I'll tell you that at least 50% of that stadium was filled with San Francisco fans. You'd never see that in New England or at a Giants game where half the fans are from out of town. But that's the nature of L.A. I mean, it's the same thing with all all their sports team and not a knock against LA it's just so transient there's not a lot of people from their relative to like the sports team so I, I think all at the end of the day I'd love to see Cincinnati do it you know like do you what? hang out with regular people I'm sorry can I listen to everything <laughs> you say do you hang out with regular people or, or just top executives and you know the creme de la, la creme people like uh, you of, I, of the world you know the expression huh? show me your closest friends and I'll show you who you are I try to hang out with people like you that I admire and want to be like and if you surround yourself with great people eventually it's going to rub off on you all right, I pull it back. You, you, you <laughs> got, you, you, you got an entry there. Okay, you've all pulled back. Everything, everything pulled back. Go Speaking ahead. of that, the one thing that is hard to do in life is stand up for things that you think are right and stand by people that you think are good people, even when good people make mistakes. And one of those people that I'd like to address with you is Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan recently they pulled together. They've been out to get Joe Rogan for a while, but the latest attack. They got him pretty good. They pulled together a compilation of Joe using the N-word and saying some, candidly, some uh, insensitive racial crap that I don't agree with whatsoever. Fans of the show know I have an African daughter that I adopted from Ethiopia. I don't like people using the N-word, even other black people. I don't, I, I don't like it, but what am I going to do? People are going to use that word. Joe used the word. He made a mistake. He apologized for it. He said some things that he himself said was reprehensible, took full responsibility for it. But to use you as an example, you would always tell people, look, being a true friend means even when it's not convenient, you got to be dependable. You don't shit can your friends because they make a mistake. You can address the problem with them. You can talk to them about it at your convenience, however you want to handle it, but you don't abandon your friends because they make a mistake. So with that said, and, I, and I, I'm sure you have some thoughts on the subject, but I'm with Joe Rogan. Hey, Joe, I know, look, everyone's supporting Joe. I'm, this isn't, I'm not unique, but I just want to put it out there that I'm with Joe Rogan. I don't agree with what he said, but I know Joe's a good person. He's done some acts of kindness for me that I will never forget and that he didn't have to do. And I'm forever grateful to the kindness that Joe Rogan has shown me. And I know you enjoyed being on your show and would like to probably say something as well. Yeah, I want to make it uh, short and succinct. It's just uh, race is very serious, um, very serious, and uh, but it should be serious. It it should not be something. You you made a comment before uh, a second ago, and you said the latest attack, uh, you know, on somebody, and it has become the weapon of choice nowadays when you do want to attack somebody to see if you can use the weapon of race. And um, race is, it's a horrible blight on humanity, on society. And it's something, again, that as bad as it is, it is equally as bad and irresponsible to use it quickly and sometimes even flippantly uh, as something to destroy people and to hurt people because it's too serious a thing because it has destroyed people throughout the annals of time in this country. It has. It shouldn't be used now as sometimes an easy weapon, a convenient weapon. I, I'm going to just finish by saying this racism is not something 
that lives in one's mouth. Racism is something that is alive in someone's heart. Joe Rogan does not have the heart of a racist. That's it. That's all I have to say. God bless everybody. Thanks, Ted. I appreciate that, and I know Joe will appreciate it. With that, let's get into Joe Rogan's sport, a sport in an organization that Joe helped build, and that's the UFC. We had a UFC fight night, Sean Strickland and Jack Hermanson, two guys that personify fighters in my mind, just two rugged guys that you would not want to get into a street fight with and they showed that on um saturday night uh five round war bashing each other about uh i think jack a couple times was getting um sean was putting it on him pretty good at times jack would continue to try to wrestle and get into a grappling match and take him down sean wasn't having any of it stuffed all the takedowns continue to batter him about shockingly and i know you agree i saw some of your tweets you were a tweet storm on saturday night they were talking about you paul felder mentioned how you kept commenting on um or that you commented on sean strickland's incredible ability to keep changing the range and step just outside of range step back in get his shots off it was a great observation felder picked up on it but shockingly Shockingly, I think it was Sal Tiamato had the fight for Jack Hermanson. I mean, it was probably that's as an egregious a scorecard as I've seen in a long, long time. I wouldn't have been surprised if one other guy gave that to Hermanson that if he refused to even take the win because it was just so out of line. I mean, Strickland won that fight hands down. After the fight, Sean said that he could have taken it more seriously, was disappointed in his performance. He said he at times he was fighting like it was almost a sparring session. And um, actually, the first fight, I think, I think it was the first fight with his new coach, Eric uh, Nixick from uh, Extreme Couture, one of the good guys of the sport, Francis Ngannou's trainer and coach. And And um, we love Eric on this show. But um, curious to hear what you thought about the fight. And um, I mean, like I said, I saw all your tweets. They were excellent, entertaining as always. But um, how'd you like the action? Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, First of all, I think that Dana, who we like, we're friendly with him. uh, Dana White, of course, the man who runs the UFC and who brought the UFC really, uh, you know, with the uh Fiat brothers i always mispronounce their name it's okay they they in line with everyone fatita there you go hey fatita guys uh good guys um i knew them from years ago actually uh before they really before the ufc really grew and uh, we used to do uh they had the station casinos i, I believe it's station casinos um I forget whatever, but they had a bunch of these casinos in Vegas and ESPN years ago when I was doing the uh, commentary for the Friday Night Fights. We used to do, you know, some shows there. So I, I knew one of the brothers. And um, and like I was saying, Dana's done, I mean, anyone who can build a product to sell for what, $4.2 billion, they've done pretty good. They've done <laughs> a pretty damn good job. Not everyone's going to agree with this and that, but at the end of the day, uh, they built something pretty big. I think Dana should take a penny of that, uh, just a little bit of that, and maybe as a per diem for these judges so they can get better eyeglasses when they need them. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, it wouldn't be, they can write it off as a cost. You know, I know he's a businessman, Dana, right? But write it off as a cost. Ken, you would lend them your glasses. You got nice looking glasses there. <laughs> you know, I, and I, yeah, I mean, I just have something where if it's necessary, if what's keeping them, what, if what's impairing them is they can't get the right, glasses with the right you know prescription let's get them for them dana let's get them for them that was outrageous uh and it reminded me it made me reminded me that wow we're not alone you know we're not alone <laughs> boxing's not alone with the bad judges <laughs> we're not, i wish you know i don't wish on no one else i don't but we're not alone uh obviously a quick wake up to that a quick reminder of that was that judge score uh split decision 
uh, you know, giving it to uh, Hermanson, one of the judges. So get past that. And that takes something to get past because that shakes you a little bit. You know, these guys put their lives on the line. They're going to get robbed, potentially get robbed. Oh, God. So uh, I, I'm i going to piggyback off something you just said at the opening when you reminded us that he had a new coach, uh, Strickland. When, when you start, I've been in that position a lot of times in boxing. When you start new with somebody, sometimes you take a step back to go three steps forward. What do I mean by that? You're teaching them new things. You're teaching them possibly a new philosophy, a new way of thinking, a new way of approaching things, a uh, new technique. And when you're learning that and you're absorbing that and you're in that process, you know, that, that initial process of developing these new things, there is a step back. And sometimes your first fight out of the shoot with that new coach is a step back. I don't think it was a step back, but I want to explain something that I thought he was very calculating. I thought he was very calm. I thought that he, he was really, really, he was economic. Uh, and he was, you know, he didn't want to waste anything and he didn't waste anything. And he was in control pretty much all night. And as I like to say, he knew his geography. You know, it was to stay on the outside where he could strike and not let Hermanson, who's very good at getting on the mat, uh, not let him get where he wanted to get. And I think Strickland displayed a lot uh, in a quiet way, in a controlled way. And sometimes you don't get credit for the effort you put out when it's in such a controlled, cerebral way. People want to see the fire. They want to see a little chaos. They want to see a little craziness. Then they say, wow! <laughs> I wanted to do that today. <laughs> wow! You know, and then and uh, you know, and and then it attaches itself to the performance. But you didn't have to say "whoa" uh, Saturday night, but it was there in, in a controlled, quiet way, with without the loud, without the noise, without the amplification. It was it was a solid, dominant, really well done, well schooled effort. In every year, even in the with the takedowns, he knew that he couldn't. He had a guy who wants to take you down, and his takedown defense, preventive defense, was tremendous. He he did not allow Hermanson to get to the dimension of the game that he needed to get to. That that was tremendous, and that gets lost. I think some of that gets lost a little bit because of the things that I just explained. And again, I'll finish up on with a new coach. When a new coach is taking over, is implementing these new things, sometimes when I say take a step back, what I mean is while you're concentrating on that stuff, you can't integrate everything into it. You're, you're concentrating on being controlled. You're concentrating on showing the new stuff, on being thoughtful of, the new stuff of having it, uh, you know, having it downloaded in your computer, right, in your brain. And while you're doing that, yeah, you, some of the other stuff might not flow. It'll flow in the next fight or the fight after. It'll come in, you know, kind of like an orchestra. You're, you're hearing mostly the horns and everything. Else. Next time, you're going to hear the drums. Next time, you're going to hear, you know, uh, the violins. Next time, you're going to hear uh, some of the other instruments. They're going to come in. Right now, he was concentrating on a certain section of the band, a certain section of the orchestra. And I, I think that what I'm describing now, I feel very confident about it only because I've been there. I understand that when you're teaching a fighter new and you're coming out with a new coach, you are going to have more concentration on what you're being taught. And that is going to force you to, to kind of, you know, quiet it down a little bit while you're, while you're getting everything, while you're getting everything in place, while you're getting everything in order, while you're getting, you know, all the cylinders eventually to, to, to all be, you know, hitting at the same time the way you want them to. So, I think, I think that's part of what people might 
have experienced and might have seen, and that's the explanation for why you saw that. Uh, again, I'm giving him. Uh, I'm. I'm I'm giving him a high grade because uh, he dominated, uh, did not allow a guy who's tremendous at taking you to the mat do that. He completely shut the guy out there. And again, he, he used his left hand to set the table for right hands all night long, all night long, the way you're supposed to do it, boxing 101. You know, and he was... Uh, Will I make a concession in this an analysis that I'm giving that there will be people out there that will say he's susceptible, he being obviously Strickland, that he's susceptible to being out-hustled, to being outworked by some guys if he doesn't get a little bit more busier sometimes in his uh, game? Yeah, I'll make that. Yes, I'll go along with that. I'll go along with that. But that's where controlling range and being a sharpshooter like he showed he was comes in. That if you control range, you can counter. And if you've got a guy who wants to be real busy and out hustle you and you can counter him with clean shots, you take some of that game away from the guy. You take some of that away from the guy. And again, yeah, could he be a little busier sometimes? Yeah, I think there's a built-in reason and you touched on and i'll tell you again i wouldn't have, i just went with this spontaneously this part of it with the coach as i heard you talk about it ken otherwise i wasn't bringing this up and and i think that that answers a little bit towards him being busier uh that he wasn't as busy as someone and he didn't need to be he didn't need to be he did what he had to do and also another Another part is I, I heard one of the commentators, they do a great job. One of them said that somebody referred uh, to Strickland as a savage. And I would say, yeah, a smart savage. <laughs> yeah. A smart, calm savage. Yeah, Sean Strickland, they do call him a savage sometimes, and he comes across, he says some wild things at times, but I'll tell you, I met him at, um, I met him in the hotel the night before, I, I, it was the New York City Marathon, coincided with a UFC event, and we were all staying in the same hotel, and I was talking to Matt Serra and Ray Longo, couldn't be nicer guys, completely complimentary, big fans of you and the show, and Sean Strickland came over, said the same thing, he couldn't have been nicer, said he was a big fan of the show, said he loved Teddy Atlas, he's a nice guy, and the other thing I'll say about Eric is, I feel like Eric is a bit like you in the sense that if you told me, hey, Teddy's training this guy or Eric's training this guy, in my mind, that fighter already passed a few personality tests where I'm like, I know that Teddy and I know guys like Eric, they don't align or affiliate with people who aren't good people. So right away, I think, okay, Sean is like, Sean's got a lot of good things going for him. I know he says some things that are out there sometimes, and I almost wonder if he's saying it for shock value to be more savage than he is. But from everything I've heard about him in the training room, he comes in into the training room every day to fight. No training, fighting every day. So, so I think when you behave like that. I add like one that, thing. Yeah. I add one thing to those uh, those comments, those, those thoughts, and uh, kudos towards him, positive things to him. And uh, Strickland grandmothers would have loved him. <laughs> yeah, they would have loved him. Yep, especially at a dinner table because he doesn't waste a damn thing. Yep, he doesn't. He doesn't waste one freaking thing. He don't leave any spinach on a plate. <laughs> you know, he takes everything off the bone. He, I mean, he doesn't throw unless he's going to land. Yep, basically, or he thinks he's going to land. Uh, you know, he, there's no real waste or throwaway punches. You know, and he is conservative, and you know he's he's not going to burn up uh, energy wise too quickly either because his demeanor is so calm. Yeah, his approach is so, you know, it, it is so exact. Yeah, where he's not looking to waste anything. Um, so, and he's very, as I like to say, he's very, and there's a quality. Everyone thinks the quality is the punches and the kicks, but he's very calm in an uncalm environment. Yep. I I like him. And, yeah. Uh, I agree 
Congratulations to Sean Strickland. I like that the end there, you saw something at the very end there, last 20 seconds maybe, where Strickland tried to goad Hermanson into opening up, but it was all cerebral, it was all smart. Uh, it was a smart savage because he was just trying to get him to get reckless. Yep. To come at him, to throw, because he couldn't catch him the way he was fighting because he wasn't leaving himself available. So he wanted him to not leave him, he wanted him to leave himself available by reaching, by looking for something big so he could drop him or possibly score, you know, score yeah. a knockout. Yep. Um, and and that was interesting. I was watching it. He, you know, he was going, come on, you know, that, uh, you know, trying to get him yeah. to come at him. Uh, go, but, of course, Hermanson probably understood it for what it was. For sure. Um, Mutual respect by the two warriors oh, yeah. at the end, too, Ken. Yeah, you too. Know, which is always nice. Yeah, for sure. That was great. And uh, let's jump into some boxing now. We haven't had much to talk about, and I'm glad to see there was some good action this weekend. Can um, I mention one thing before we course. close that up? Just And literally, it'll take like 10 seconds. Um, Max Maximoff and Soriano on the earlier part of that, that UFC card. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some fans out there that want to hear a little something. Mac Maximoff... Again, not as anything scintillating happening in that fight, but Maximoff was the boss uh, with the inside position. I talk about the geography. He understood that pretty well. He got it. Uh, he was the boss with the inside position, uh, controlled him uh, when he had to control him. And I like the way, kind of reminded me a little bit of a fighter where, boxer where he landed these really short shots on the inside like he used his left hand or right hand whichever one but pop 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 yeah. you know just these little short shots inside uh made the most of his position that's all yep. we'll go to the boxing yep let's get into the boxing um pay-per-view card keith thurman keith thurman versus barrios uh barrios coming off the loss to um tank davis uh, Thurman coming off a loss uh, two and a half, almost coming up on almost three years ago against uh, Manny Pacquiao, that big payday. I was curious to see how Thurman came back because, you know, two plus years off after a big Manny Pacquiao payday, you almost wonder if he still has the same desire to fight. It seems odd to be that in be so inactive for so long. But um, Keith Thurman looked good. I thought it took him a minute or two to get his engine running, but then he battered Barrios around the ring. Well, one of the things that I thought was interesting is Barrios, for the most part, I thought was outboxing um, Tank Davis pretty good uh, in their fight before he got caught and I think dropped in the 11th, knocked out in the 11th. But Thurman boxed his ears in most of the night, I thought. So I was just thinking, man, Tank Davis has been, you know, they, they're they doing a good job of picking the exact opponent for him, but they better work on a few things before they get in against these elite guys. That was my takeaway on, on Barrios. But Thurman looked good. He was uh, 118, 110 on two cards, 117, 111, convincing one-sided win. How'd you like the action? What'd you think of um, Keith Thurman? I'm going to piggyback real quick off of the, something that you just said. Uh, I pick it back because, you know, you and Rob have strong legs. So I feel like, hey, I could do that. You <laughs> I know? got you. You're never going to let me down. You're never going to drop me. And um, so the one of the things that hit me was you got Barrios fighting a, a bigger guy, a, a big, full, big welterweight. Barrios, you know, was moved up. And uh, so you got him in there with a, guy and a guy who had a reputation one time they call him one time you know for a reason he had a reputation and he hits you one time you go whatever and that's what they were building him up as early in his career Thurman big puncher uh and you know the more I saw Barrios eat some of the shots from Thurman and he got hurt several times towards the end but the and and remarkable remarkable heart uh Remarkable grit and heart from Barrios. I have to say that he deserves that to be said uh, to survive. And but he took these shots, and the more he took these big shots from Thurman, the more I thought, "Wow, what a puncher Javante Davis is." <laughs> That's what it made me think. Yeah. Ken. I was like, I was like, nobody's talking about that, and I'm like, "Wow, 
What I think one of the commentators might have said something. Actually, I want to always be fair, uh, always. So it's important. So, but I I thought it throughout you know the night and more and more as it went on, like punches as I always would say. I'm sure, somebody else is saying it now. Um, <laughs> I would always. Oh, you can be I can't help it. <laughs> can can I can't help it? Sometimes well, I'm the, human. It, sometimes I'm the, human. Sometimes the truth hurts people. Let me just say that. Tank Davis, to your point, remember the knockout against Leo Santa Cruz? Oh my God, I yeah, thought he might have killed him. But Tank was getting outboxed in that fight. But you, to your point, he also was coming up from like 130s, 130s to fight. I think he fought Barrios at 140, so Barrios moves up to 47. But to your point, he took those shots from Thurman at 147, and Tank coming up from like 135 to 140 and smashed him one Just, shot. Well, so- yeah, I mean, well, he dropped him twice and then finally the last one. Yeah. But he was, it just reminded me of what I always say. Punches are born, they're not made. That's it. And he's a prime example and a, a, a great example of, when I say that, of showing it what it is. I mean, Tank Davis is just a born puncher. Yeah. And the one thing that I'm going to, come back at you a little bit with that I think you're a little erroneous is to mock him a little bit Davis as just a puncher or just a, a walking guy that could be easy to outbox he's got great skills I I think Davis I don't know if he's always respected enough for those skills because he is such a big puncher that we look at that sometimes but he is a He's a good boxer. He's a great counter puncher. He he's um, his defense is good. Uh, he's smart. He's cerebral. He 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 can set you up. He knows what to do at the right time. Um, Tank Davis is a lot more than just a puncher. He's a damn good, solid all around fighter uh, that has a lot of dimensions to him. But uh, that that's one thing that I s- struck me during the fight is. When when I saw Barrios eating those punches, I said, "Wow, uh, he wasn't able to eat Davis's punches, obviously." And uh, it shows you what a puncher Davis is. Uh, I I didn't think Thurman has not looked the same all the way back to when he had surgery years ago. His first surgery, I believe, he had surgery. And then he was off about two, two and a half years after that surgery, somewhere in that neighborhood. He's been off a couple gaps of two years in his career. But he, and then he came back against Josito Lopez, I believe, if my memory serves me right. And he almost got knocked out in that fight. He started off good, then he kept pulling back straight with his hands down, and and Josito was catching him, catching him. Josito was a smaller guy moving up, so he didn't really have the bang to really damage Thurman the way somebody who had a little bit more weight on him and a little more power could have. I mean, he was in danger. of He could have got knocked out in that fight. I mean, he won the fight. He got ahead early in the fight, but he was he was getting caught really bad hooks as he was pulling back towards the end of the night and um, put himself in a perilous position. And I thought... He's never, ever since that layoff, and then, of course, after that fight, he fought Pacquiao, and he got beat by the legendary Pacquiao. I I never thought he looked near the same Thurman that we thought we we were going to get. And the Thurman that was tested against Porter, you know, I know he had a lot of uh, hand, you know, hand-picked opponents on his way up. That's what everyone does. But then when he fought Porter... That was a real test, and he beat Porter, and he took what he had to take, and he was, you know, again, he never looked like that fighter again until maybe the other night, where this is the best I've seen him look since then. That's how impressed I was. Uh, Yeah, he was fighting a smaller guy that moved up, I get it, but and not a big punch and all that stuff, and a guy who's coming off a knockout loss, you know, against uh, Davis. But he was fighting a solid guy, uh, a, a tough, tough, tough fighter. 
a legitimate guy. And Thurman got hurt towards the end of the fight. And that I have a little bit of a, what do you call it? Um, I have a little complaint here with the camera people or the uh, the producer in that fight. Because tell me if I'm wrong, Ken. But I, I unless I missed it, they didn't really do a good job of showing you that punch that hurt Thurman. And it was... It was important to show it. Why? Well, it's always important to show a punch that hurts somebody. But especially in this fight, it was a one-sided fight all night up to that point. And if if you want to keep the attention of the audience, which of course you always do, right? You want to keep them there. You have to give them a reason to be there. And that was a reason to be there, that Barrios could still knock him out. He could still pull it out of the fire. So you have to show that punch. You have to show that. Now, maybe I missed seeing it as clearly as I could have, but you have to show it more than once. And I just didn't think they did a good job doing that, where it's such... I mean, it's such a possible turning point of the fight with a guy who's getting beat up all night, hurts him, and maybe there's a chance it's going to turn. We got to see it. And I didn't see it. Uh, I know that Thurman's been hurt by body punches and everyone kind of went along that line like he got hurt in the body uh, because he has been hurt in the past by body punches. But I didn't I didn't get a clear look at it. Teddy, for the price... Uh, did I we, miss it? Did, for, did, for I, the, did I miss it, Ken? For the price we paid for that pay-per-view, that's a whole other topic I want to address with you after we break down the fights. It's just, if it's infuriating that I pay that price, that price for that fight. I think it was eighty dollars. I I I, I try eighty dollars. Like, yeah, I try not to even. I wasn't gonna say none because I I feel I didn't want people to laugh at me and say, hey sucker, <laughs> you know, I, you know, sucker, you know that you know, I uh, actually felt like that when I was buying it. I'm like, at some point, we should just like boycott this crap and not even cover it. You want to charge us $80? No, you know what I thought about? I didn't think about boycotting. I thought about the days 30 years ago when they had the black boxes. What happened to those black boxes? <laughs> That's think, what I thought. I'm being honest. No, I think that, that there are people uh, that can get those illegal streams. I don't like to do it, but it's 80 oh, bucks for like a fight. Do wait, let me wait. Eight. Stop, 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 stop. All right, Ken, here we are. I got a legal stream for you. You don't have to pay the 80. What are you going to do? Take it? <laughs> okay. Here's your 80 dollars back. I got this I got this stream. Or, I mean, I think you could I think you could find a way. You're a decent person. You don't hurt nobody. You're raising a beautiful family. You care about good things. I I don't think taking uh 80 bucks uh out of the or not out of their pocket, but keep, well, yeah, I guess it's out of their pocket. 80 bucks out of the pocket of a rich promoter. I think you could live with that. I have a funny feeling your conscience will not keep you up tonight. Yeah, there's if no you love lost for the promoters, but I got to say, 80 bucks for that, that should have been on like HBO After Dark. I mean, that could have been a Friday night show. I mean, no offense, but come on, like... No one's no one was clamoring for that. No one was like, "Oh, thank God they're making the Thurman Barrios fight." It's like, come on, it's a get it's a get back fight for Thurman. It is what it is. Both coming off losses. There was no like uh, it's frustrating. Come on, like don't do the fans like this. 80 bucks UFC hey, was Hey, you're on an for investment free. capital guy, whatever that it's called. You're you're into investments. I don't think that you would recommend anybody to have been an investor in that show. That night, because <laughs> how many how many buys could they have done? Or besides you and me, that's two. <laughs> but how many? Uh, let's go over. Let's just go over this real quick. You you got a guy. You got a guy who hasn't fought in two and a half years. He he hasn't last fought, and he's fought twice in twenty years. And I know I'm kidding, but really, it felt like that. It felt like that. And I like Thurman. I like him a lot, but. You got a guy that don't fight. He hasn't fought in two and a half years. He's fighting a guy who just got knocked out by Tank Davis. Real game guy. I love Barrios. But a guy that got knocked out in his last fight. So you're not completely sure how he's going to behave. You know, how he's going to be. Uh, if he's still going to have ghosts in the belfry, so to speak. As I used to say when um, I was calling the fight to the ESPN. That, that'll be used in the next ESPN. And fight. Teddy, it's also um, a guy who somewhere. just got knocked out at 140. Moving up to 147. Yeah, and, and a guy who's moving. <laughs> yes, a guy who's moving up. A guy who's moving up in weight. And it's on at midnight. Okay. 
Uh, Might even I mean, been later. Uh, I mean, it was so crazy. It was so uh, uh, late. Well, it was offensive. Uh, well, well, it ended around one in the morning because yeah. I know what time I wound up going up to bed. But uh, I mean, so you got. I don't think you would tell somebody, hey, you know, uh, if Al Heyman or somebody Fox uh, or what was it? Was it Fox? Uh, Fox. This uh, was Fox uh, pay per view. Uh, yeah, Fox paper. So if Al Heyman, if, I, if they said, hey, listen, we're looking for investors, we're going to give you a great opportunity. You always wanted to be involved in boxing in a, you know, in a, in, a, in this kind of way, in a business way. Uh, here, here's a chance to invest in this. I think you might pass on this one. You know what I mean? Not you only, might pass. Not only I, would I, I, but you know that at one point Al did, PBC did raise like, Big money, maybe even like over a hundred million from some Wall Street investment firms. I think five hundred million, five hundred yeah. million. As long as we're gonna throw uh, numbers around, let's throw the right numbers. Yeah. five hundred million. I Go think ahead. It was, I think it was led by maybe Newberger Berman. I'm pretty sure they were on. If I'm wrong, it was a big, like, well-respected Wall Street firm. Like working at a place like Newberger Berman is like, oh shit, that's like you know, you work at Goldman Sachs. They're they're real. So I think that they invested and threw in with this and like literally got their pants pulled down. And thought that they knew oh fine we know finance we know investments threw in and uh, got burned badly matter of well, fact no you know what they say now you know they after that experience we know lawsuits yeah <laughs> that's true then that they do those guys don't they it's very we know we know because there were lawsuits that followed those kind that of deal. firms very rarely get burned and uh and yeah. you know that deal what that deal did as long as you brought it up and were on this and, you know... Turned off uh, the investment some, community to combat sports? It, well, it might have done that. <laughs> but it, it, what it really did, it ended 18-year run of Friday Night Fights. Yep. Yeah, it did. Because that replaced... Because when ESPN heard somebody was coming into business and would pay them to put fights on... You know, after they cleared out their ear to make sure they weren't hearing things, and they said, could you repeat that, please? We'll pay you for two years to put fights on, uh, and we just want you to air it. Um, let me just talk to the other big shots at ESPN. Give me one minute. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. Um, <laughs> and that was the end. <laughs> and that was the end of Friday Night Fights, really. Do you know, uh, uh, hey, I, I don't even know if we ever talked about this. One time, some investor friends, well-respected, very smart guys, they said, hey, would you sit on a call? And it was a fight promotion. I don't want to say who it is. Small promotion. They were starting up. They had, we were on one of the networks on like Friday nights trying a new model. I mean, they started. So these investors, they didn't know anything about about the sport, the, the business of boxing. So I sat in and I listened and I started asking the, the promoter, the guy who was like raising the money, questions just about how are you going to get guys who are promoted by other promoters to fight on your card. I don't understand. They had no answers. Needless to say, I told the investors, please don't do this. Like if, if that were my money, I'd rather light it on fire. And sure enough, I, that, that show, I'll tell you when we're done, but that show, I never saw them put another fight on TV. That was the last, they, they were raising money. Like, yeah, we got all these other shows coming up, never to be heard from again. They would have probably raised the money and been like, yeah, we're bankrupt. Sorry. It was, I mean, I don't know that they would have done that, but it was as soon as they realized that someone on the call and I, and I don't profess to know the business of boxing, like someone like yourself or some of these other guys that have been around, but I knew enough to ask questions that the promoters realized, oh, he's asking the right questions. This is probably going nowhere. And the call was very short. <laughs> the investors another didn't. knockout on a, a no, another knockout on a ledger of Ken Ryder. Now, <laughs> Listen, getting back to the, well, you gave him good advice and you probably did save him a lot of money. Uh, getting back to this fight, I, Thurman, I said earlier in the breakdown when we started this that Thurman, you know, on his way up was built as this, this go get you, seek and destroy, you know, Mike Tyson in the welterweight body uh, where he was KO and everybody is just tremendous. Part. I got to say back then, I think I said it on ESPN actually, I called some of his fights where I always thought he was a little overrated as a puncher. Uh, a lot of people would jump on me and say, oh, how could you say that? I thought he was a very skillful fighter, a boxer. I thought, you know, it's not like he's a, you know, powder puff 
puncher. Not, I'm not saying that at all. I thought he had great, uh, just great skills of great, good speed, quickness, uh, very diverse. He could go after you. He could press. He could also box. He could use the ring. He had great legs. Um, actually, I went as far to say on one of the shows on ESPN uh, back in his earlier part of his career that he was the most athletic boxer in boxing. The most athletic, and that's quite a statement. And Pacquiao, you know, was getting a little older. So, you know, I if not the best athlete, one of the top two or three uh, in the whole sport. And and then I watched the fight Saturday, and it reminded me of why I made that statement. He looked like the, one of the best athletes in boxing overall. and But his temperament, to what I'm talking about being one time, hit you one time, the name, the, you know, the, the reputation of being this great puncher, his temperament, your temperament is always attached to your skill. What do I mean that? You could be the greatest puncher in the world, but if your temperament is not to go get guys, you're not going to show that attribute of power as much as somebody else who tends to be more aggressive, tends to be more assertive. That is not the personality. You are attached to your personality, how your skills are dispersed, how they're used. And his personality, and I, I think I was probably the first one to touch on this in his career, has always been to be careful, to be thoughtful. He's a very smart guy. Uh, to be responsible defensively. You know, you, you are in a very tough, dangerous sport. And to to box, his temperament was always towards that. Yeah, he'd go get you if he saw an opportunity to. And he got a lot of opportunities on his way up. A lot, which all fighters do. Again, when you're at that, you know, when you're at that stage in your career where you're picking opponents and you can pick opponents uh, at that point. But his temperament was always recognized by me to be a guy who would rather box than get in a firestorm and it showed again the other night where he came out early very smart guy to send a message the old Keith Thurman is back everyone was wondering the old Keith there I'm gonna walk you down I'm gonna be the bigger guy you know you're smaller I'm gonna be the bigger guy I'm gonna do the things a bigger guy does with a small guy I'm gonna walk you down I'm gonna hurt you and I'm gonna be the boss and he started out that way but then, and I, I even tweeted this. I wonder how long until he goes to boxing. And he did, because that's his temperament. When he didn't get his way completely, he went to boxing. No knock on him. He's dimensional, very versatile, as I said. Um, very smart. Uh, he did a great job of mixing it up, where he pressed in spots to show, yeah, I'm the bigger guy. I want to keep you in your place a little bit. That's important. Keep the guy from getting confident. And then he boxed in spots. He was the best Keith Thurman I've seen, like I said, all the way back before that layoff when he got that first surgery in his career and then before the, the Josito Lopez fight. Um, he, he, looked, he, he looked that good. But I will say that I was laughing when somebody said, I think it was during the broadcast, I wonder what he's got left. I laughed right away. You know, my answer was, what do you mean what's he got left? Physically? Of course, that's what they were implying. He's, he's 34 years old, I think, whatever that, somewhere there, 33, 34. Ken, when I heard them say, that's the question. What's he got left? I said to myself, there's no question. He's got plenty left. This is a guy with low mileage. This is a guy who who has, you know, I mean, he's been inactive more than he's been active. If you look at his career, his he's career. Thir he's the, 33. The career, his years of inactivity way outweigh his years of activity. Yep. I don't need that in front of me. I know that. So when they said, 
Oh, I wonder what he's got left. I was like, what are you kidding me? You should you should be thinking and looking other places if you want to look, you know, for something to talk about in this fight. You know, you, everyone's always looking for something, right? Look for something else because he there's not a problem with what he's got left. He's got no miles on his odometer. You'd go buy that car in a minute, you know, in a minute. You'd say, wow, that car's been kept in a garage. I'm buying it. So even if it is 33. So my thought went to where is he at mentally? That's the question with Keith Thurman. And it's the question now for the people that love him or wonder whether or not they could hook their wagon to him again as far as his future goes at this point. Does he still have a future with the big boys, with the top guys? It's all about the mental part because he's been a guy that sometimes I used to think was almost too smart to be a fighter or, or, or so smart he would be a terrific fighter, a world champion, but in some ways too smart for his own good when it comes to the longevity of this career. when it comes Because when you get down to the longevity of this career, it gets risky, it gets tough, it gets... Stay. And to his credit, he's a smart guy. To his credit, he's a guy that would think about the possible consequences of staying too long in his career. And, and of not even staying too long, of being in a long couple fights. Uh, so... I always thought that that could be as great as that can serve him in the ring, being smart. It could be a hindrance to him outside where he thinks deeply about getting out at the right time. And he made a lot of money early, thanks to Al Heyman. All Al Heyman's guys made a lot of money, all of them. And I don't know if they're making quite as much as they used to make because Al doesn't have quite as low... You know, quite as fat a wallet as he used to have. You touched on that with some of those those guys that um, are hedge fund guys. But he he made a lot of money early, and I felt that it showed that part of the demise, if you will, of Thurman. Yeah, he got injured and everything else, and and then he was inactive and coming back and then gone again. I yeah, some of it was physical. But a lot of it was mental, of making that money, being smart, and not really loving the sport to the extent that you're willing to risk yourself in it uh, anymore when maybe you don't have to. I always thought that about Thurman, that that was what was at the heart of everything with Thurman when it came to trying to understand you know, his future. What does he have left? You know, what can he still do? Where's he been? I thought it was always attached to that. And when I saw him the other night, Ken, and I heard him talk, I was wondering at the beginning, is that just a sales pitch? You know, because that's what everyone does. They give their yeah. sales pitch. They promote themselves. They're not going to come out and say, you know what, I'm one and done. I got my foot halfway out the door. You wouldn't watch them then. So, of course, they're going to tell you, the return of one time, one time. You know, of course, they're going to do all that. But when it was over with and I listened to them and I saw what I saw throughout the night, I kind of believed them that it's important to them again. I, I felt like boxing hadn't been important to him for a while mm -hmm. because of everything I just explained. And I felt the other night that boxing is once again important to him. Now, do I think if you put my if you put a gun to my head, a lot of people would like to do that, <laughs> but um, if you put a gun to my head and said, Teddy, can he beat the two top welterweights right now, Spence and Crawford, I would not bet that he could. Not right now. I would not bet that he could. Um, he's got some physical, technical habits. He boxes beautifully. Beautifully. But he'll drop his hands once in a while where you can catch him clean. I got he'll one jump for you. In. Keithy Thurman versus Ugas. Who you like? Very interesting. Both PBC. Very interesting. Either Thurman. Thurman's either going to out-hustle or out-box him uh, on the scorecards be busier, outbox him, keep more balance, or he's gonna get caught with a he's gonna get caught with a counter. 
That's the fight. I just broke it down. Take it to the bank. It's, it's going to be one or the other. If he does, and he's got a pretty good chin. So at the end of the day, he'll probably win a decision on um, Thurman. But that is to the heart of what I'm talking about. That from a technical standpoint, he jumps in. And guys like Crawford are great counterpunchers. And, and even Spence will catch him jumping in maybe. He got away with it, and it looked spectacular. I'm not knocking him. He got away with it the other night because he was faster. He was quicker. And I'm going to put one other thing. He deserves it. I always put in what I think people deserve. He was smart. He knew what he was doing, and he got away with it. He was jumping in, leading with left hooks. He could have got caught. If I was in Barrio's corner, the game plan would have been one thing. Sit on right hands and time him one time tonight, at least, when he jumps in and leads with a left hook. Time him with a right hand. But he wasn't able to. Why? Well, because Dermot was quick enough. He was quick enough. Just like Pacquiao used to jump in in his prime. And he was quick enough. He got away with it. And then one night he didn't get away with it against a guy named Marquez, uh, another Hall of Fame fighter, another iconic fighter. Uh, one of a uh, long list that joins the long list of great, great, great Mexican champions. Um, but Pacquiao also had his way with Marquez on other nights. You know, that, that was a rivalry that went back and forth. You never knew uh, who was going to win. I mean, it was always close, always close. Even if the judges didn't quite give it what it deserved on the scorecards, believe me, in the ring where it counts, where the truth always survives and is always there, uh, it was they were they were all close. But that's that's my assessment of Keith. Uh, just terrific performance. Uh, you know, I think that he's back uh, as far as wanting to be back. You know, you can't be back if you don't want to be back. You can't be back if it's just for the money. I really think that he's back because he missed something. He missed something. He just got married. Now, you know, so his life is good. I, I think he was just missing something. Maybe the attention that you get in boxing, the, the, the importance that you feel from people in the sport, you know, all of that. Just all of it. And uh, it's going to be interesting to follow next and you made an interesting call right there that's the one i'd like to see next for him you know i know that you say well he's been off two and a half years he needs a car he didn't look like he needs any kind of uh you know uh, sharpening up fights uh if you will he he got 12 rounds of that uh, and he got tweaked at the end where he got hurt. I'm still looking to see it. If, if Ken, the next time, you know, I know you <laughs> hang out with all these producers and executives. If you're hanging out with the guys like this weekend, maybe having a martini with the heads of Fox, could you ask them if they could go back and and to the archives of last week and show the replay of where he got hurt? Because I like to see it. I'm going to call it. And I think the fans, I think the fans, and you never answered that question complete. Yeah. See how I always have a way of circling all the way back. Um, did did you see how he got hurt? No. Because I'm being honest. No, I no, I didn't, I didn't it. see it. Yeah. I, I didn't I, see it. I don't remember seeing the replay. I They showed something. It was a replay. But I, as far as my eyes, I didn't see the punch that hurt him. And and then they didn't show it again. And I know one thing. I used to drive producers a little crazy. Um, <laughs> I, I If I'm there, I hit my talk back. There's a talk back, <laughs> yeah. people, where you could talk to the truck and, and you guys don't hear me. And I would have talked back as I did throughout my career. Hey, hey, <laughs> I want to see that replay. <laughs> and I think the fans do too. <laughs> Get it up there because I ain't going away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep hounding you all night. Show me the replay. <laughs> Keeping them on their toes. <laughs> well, it'll be interesting to see what Keith is up to next. Let's talk about the undercar. We had um, Leo Santa Cruz back in action. 
taking on uh, Keenan Carbajal at 130, 10-round fight, um, one-way domination by uh, Leo Santa Cruz. All three judges had it, a shutout, 100-90. to 90. Um, You know, Leo's a good fighter, and if he's not in there with top-tier guys, he's going to dominate just like he did um, coming off that vicious, just absolutely vicious knockout uh, at the hands of Javante Davis. Um you know, Leo's kind of been all over the place in the weight classes, but he uh, he looked good at 130. He uh, he put it on uh, Carbajal, who was stepping up big time in competition from where he had been, and um, I think Carbajal was He was up. the bigger guy, though, physically. Physically, he was the bigger guy. Yeah, Carbajal you know, was on an 18-fight win streak, but, you know, as you always say, okay, 18 fights, who, who was he fighting? Well... They weren't Leo Santa Cruz types, and Leo uh, showed everyone what he was made of and outboxed him, you know, from start to finish. In some ways, the only way you're going to beat, really beat Cruz, and I don't completely mean what I'm saying right now, but I'm making a point, is to do what Devontae Davis did, knock him out. Because not too many people are going to outwork him. Nope. Because he he throws an awful lot of punches. Yeah, I mean the guy the guy's a work a workhorse when it comes to punch numbers. You know, uh, I mean, he, again, he's not going to get out hustled or outpointed by too many guys unless you really can hurt him, or you're just such a good boxer that you can outbox him. But he puts so much pressure on, and he goes to the body so well and so consistent. Even that's hard to do. You know, and he does it very fundamentally tight where he comes in behind the jab and he goes to work. He brings a lunch pail. This guy is a blue collar guy. For sure. He brings a lunch, and he's a great guy. He's, he's a family guy. He's got his family around him. And he's a great guy. And uh, he loves boxing. This is a guy who you could see, unlike what I was saying about Thurman, you could see that boxing is, you know, how important it is to him and his family, the lineage of his family. Boxing is their friend. You know, boxing uh, lives with them. It's very important to him, even though he's had so many fights and been around so many years. Uh, and and you made a good point, Ken. You know, a guy that's been around this long, you wonder when they start to get shop worn, when they start to get a little shot, uh, especially after knockout loss. But he showed he's not. He, he showed he's not. He, he's a guy, guy who, you know, he, he still looks prime. Uh and you got to love the guy. You know, he just comes to fight. And nothing fancy. You beat me or I beat you. But I'm going to be there. I'm bringing my lunch pail. And I'm going to be there all night doing what I do. Uh, you know, um, I had him on ESPN years ago. And I picked up, I was, I think, the first guy to really mention it. He's got a habit. It's just a habit, Ken, of doing this. Yeah. He just he just shakes his he twists his right hand. Like he's like this. And he just twitches the right hand. He shakes it. Yeah. And it's a habit. It's not for any purpose other than uh, and a lot of people think his hands hurt. Well, yeah. then it's been hurt for 20 years <laughs> because it's almost like you a know, tick. He, yeah. Exactly. So I always would get to me because I would always I'm a you know I'm a commentator I'm a broadcaster I'm an analyst but I'm a trainer that's what I am I'm I'm a trainer and my whole life and a teacher so it would get to me I would say why does the trainer in the corner why does nobody and the, and the commentators never mention it either but that what what would get me would be the trainers. Why does nobody ever tell him to attack when the, when they when the fighter sees he's shaking that right hand during that time, whether it's one second, two seconds, second and a half that he's doing it, he's not throwing it because he's shaking it. Yeah. Why does nobody ever tell him, Ken, in all the years he's been doing this, to attack on that side immediately? Soon as you see him do attack on that, go, go. Attack right to that side because he won't throw it. You have a free entry point. You don't get that too often. You got a free pass. You got a free, you don't have to pay a toll. You get to cross the bridge free. 
That reminds me of when like you, when, if a fighter is like bouncing too much, you can catch him in between the bounce if he has a habit of like getting off his feet yeah, at any one point. A hundred percent. That's how we beat Holyfield with Michael Mora. Yep. When when I was breaking film down and I was getting ready to go to camp with him, I had to come up. I have to go to camp with a strategy, and that we're going to build around. And the camp by the time I finished breaking film, I it was like funny. It was one night I'm watching. Why I what I gotta see something that we can win this fight. I gotta see something we can build around. Something that we can bank. And then I was like, ah, I see it. Uh, the great event, the Holyfield bounces in front of you. And when he's bouncing, you can hit him with the jab. And you could disrupt his rhythm just long enough to keep this great warrior busy, to catch him off rhythm, off stride, and be able to score something where he doesn't continue coming forward for that, you know, for that second, that second and a half. And it's the same thing here, you know. If I was getting ready to fight Cruz, that's the first thing I'd say. Okay, I get my fighter in the film room, sit him down, say, okay, look, you see him doing this, twisting that right hand? You immediately attack to that side because he's not throwing it. You got about a second and a half. It's kind of like those great movies when they're getting ready to rob a bank. All right, now when we cut the alarms, we got about, we got about two minutes to get in there and get out. Yep. Okay, guys? You got two minutes to get in and get out. Not two and a half, not two minutes and ten seconds. You got. You don't have time to listen to Ken in his podcast. <laughs> you got two minutes. Get in, get out, and you know. And then if they do it within two minutes, they they get away with the robbery. So, I, I again, it just would it would frustrate me as a trainer that nobody ever took advantage of that or used that information. You know, but um, Carl Bohol, uh would have had to do that a lot to win the fight. Yeah, <laughs> because you know he was he was outgunned as far he was a bigger guy naturally, but that you know that um, I I mean, I'm watching. I saw Carl Bohol one time. It was funny. Uh, he likes to sometimes ride with the right hands, like the great Roberto Duran used to do. But he's not Roberto Duran, you know. There's not too many people who are. It's not a knock on him. There's not too many people that are Roberto Duran. But Duran used to do this, Ken. When he saw the right hand, instead of slipping it, sometimes he would do this. He'd ride with it. Oh, yeah. he was he was something. He'd go like this and really ride with it. Just the uh, ride that like you ride a wave. <laughs> he would ride that punch. And Carbo tried to do it, but he didn't. <laughs> but the, you know the the wave kind of got him. He was a split uh, second uh, late. The, 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 yeah, a little bit. The 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 wave crashed on him a little bit. But I only saw one really good round, interested round. I know people talked about whether or not Cabo might have had an injury uh, with his, I think it was his left hand, whatever. But I only saw one really invested round where he invested himself in that round. I forget what it was. It was later in the fight where I thought he might have won the round, actually. Other than that, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was Mrs. Santa Cruz. Yeah. Uh, well, the fight. One other thing I made a note of sure. in my 19 pages of notes over here. <laughs> I work at this, guys. I work at this. Um, for you, the fans, for you. I try to deliver everything if I think it's worth delivering. I just thought it was a little, I don't know. Out of the ordinary, that the referee paid so much attention to Carbo Hall's cut. Uh, uh, not Carbo Hall's cut. Um, Santa Cruz. Uh, Santa Cruz's cut. I mean, listen, I'm for safety too. First thing, safety. And listen, But it wasn't obstructing much, really. It was on his eyelid. I, the eyelid could be a bad spot. It could be a bad spot. But after no you have the it. doctor look at it once, unless it gets like ma massively worse 100%. or it's pouring blood, I didn't 100%, notice anything Ken. deteriorate. And and he just kept going to the looking at the bringing the doctor in, and and looking at this cut. And again, when we saw it, it it wasn't getting worse, and we've seen much worse, uh, much worse, much worse. But again, I'm not trying to minimize it. We, it is, we want safety. It wasn't a bad spot on the eyelid. But I, 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 don't know, I don't know the last time I saw a referee 
pay that much attention to a cut of that size, or at least that look like we've seen worse. Well, the fight before that was a super entertaining 154 pounders, uh, two really good guys, uh, Vlad Hernandez and Jesus Ramos. Ramos gets the six round stoppage. Uh, I thought the fight was really entertaining and Ramos put an exclamation point on it at the end. Uh, two southpaws going at it, young up and coming fighters. And um, I, th- I thought that was a really good fight. That was I, I, I that made the well, Hernandez look, was an up and coming young fighter. He was more the veteran uh, yeah. who was there to test Ramos. That's uh, right. But I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. Uh, you know what it was, Ken? And you're 100 percent right. It was a test for the young Ramos. They threw him in there. Not, they didn't throw him in. He was ready for it. But they put him in there with a guy that would test him a little bit, or they thought would test him a little bit. Uh, a guy in Hernandez who's a tough guy. He's a, he, you know, he's more mature. He's been around longer, and you know, he's a busy guy. He's in your face. He's throwing, and and he's, I think he's for well, obviously better guys than Ramos has up to this point. So it was supposed to be a test for Ramos, and it was. It's the kind of fight that will help him make him better. But the one thing that I noticed right away about the fight, Ken, where the commentators were saying, oh, this is going to be a test, this is going to be this, which, you know, it was. And, and wow, he's right in there. Look at Hernandez coming at him. There's only one thing that I saw that mattered. You know, a lot of times there's a few things. One thing that was prevalent, really, one guy was throwing punches. That would be Mr. Hernandez. And the other guy was placing punches. That would be Mr. Ramos. That's all that mattered to me. As soon as I saw that, I was like, hey, guys, calm down. If I'm sitting in a chair next to you, you're going to be upset at me right now (laughs) because I'm going to say, I'm going to say, hey, guys, I don't care what the action is. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Only one guy's winning this fight. It's going to be Ramos. Why? Because he's not just throwing punches. He's placing punches in a smart, accurate way to the body counter punches to the head when when ramos reached a little bit or got a little fat with his punches there's only one guy winning this freaking fight it's just a matter of time it's just a matter of time and sure enough it was just a matter of time and by the way, uh, Vlad Hernandez was coming off an upset win over the great J-Rock Williams, Julian Williams, who was the former yes. unified champ at 154, that's what I'm right? So, well, that's why I said yeah. that. That's why I wanted to catch you because this is a veteran guy. This is a guy who experienced. This is a guy who's fought better fighters than Ramos had. It was a guy that was put there for a reason. Yep. He was going to test Ramos. Yeah, good point. And, and he did to that point. But only one guy was freaking winning because of that. That's all. Yeah, that's all I had to see. Uh, he did a beautiful. I was very impressed. Right, Ramos. He drops his hands a little bit, gets touched sometimes because of that. But he was calm in the eye of the storm. He sat in a pocket with a guy who wants to fight in a pocket. He sat right now because he recognized. <laughs> yeah, you could outbox the guy and catch him on the outside. Yes, yes, you have an option with this kind of guy. But you could also sit in a pocket and punch inside his punches. And that's what he did. And it made for good action, which is important because he's going to be an entertaining fighter, a guy that puts fannies in his seats, fan-friendly. Uh, another saying I used to use, uh, <laughs> or what I was calling fights. And so, so he's got all that going for him. But the thing, the thing I, I really, well, I loved a lot of things about him. Uh, but Ramos was so calm in a non-calm environment as i say uh in the eye of the storm and he was not deterred even when when ramos had a few little moments it did not discourage ramos from doing what he knew he wanted to do and could do he was steadfast he he hung in there he placed shots you know um Real clean, like I said, I thought he could have went to the body a little more. But he went to the body, he went to the head, and he showed a quality that I love in a fighter, Ken. Either you got this or you don't have it. 
You know what that quality is? What's to that? be a really good finisher. Yep. He's a finisher. I love it. I love it. I love because when he finally heard him, man, he knew what to do. Oh, he yeah. put him away. Yeah. Not everybody, that's not automatic. Not everybody's a finisher. This kid Ramos is a finisher. Yeah. He's a I love that. And he went and he finished him. Yeah, great yeah. one. Um, Teddy before very we- smart, very patient. These are the words I wrote down. Ramos is a nice looking prospect. Calm, smart, patient. And when he hurts somebody, he gets them out of there. Yep. Uh, Teddy, before we um, talk about what we've got on tap, I just want to give a quick shout out to our number one sponsor, Athletic Greens. Last week when we were in, um, we recorded the interview with um, Brandon Moreno. I was in Malibu with Rob and as we was, Rob was nice enough to give me a ride to the airport. And as we were going, you know who called me? Irish Mickey Ward called and said, hey, Ken, it is a true story. Uh, what's up with Athletic Greens? I said, it's the best. You got to be taking it, especially for guys our age. You should be taking Athletic Greens every day. He's like, okay, perfect. I said, actually, they'll probably want to work with you. But So Rob's connecting them with the, with the company. But in the meantime, I said, let me send you some from my own private stash. I treat this the way uh, Escobar used to treat his stash of supplements. I protect my Athletic Greens. Here's the new package. Here's the new packaging. That's, that, right wait, here. wait, 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 wait. Uh, you can't, you can't say something like that <laughs> and then just bar- pass right over. That's, let's make this very clear. Ken does not have any supplements anywhere near, <laughs> near like Escobar had. There, there is. No, please, before you guys even put down your phones. Put down your tweets. Put down whatever devices you have in your hand right now that you're about to go nuts. Ken does not, and then he's just he's just using words in a smart way. <laughs> but there's and to get your attention, which he did, he got your attention for a good product. But his products, our products, uh, Athletic Green products, have no relation <laughs> to any of the products. That a guy named Escobar had. Go on, Ken. That's, Continue, please. That's how I protect my my athletic green stash. It stays in a safe. Uh, so anyway, Mickey called me. We sent him. A, uh, we sent him some while he's getting linked up with the company. But again, I talk about this all the time. These guys spent ten years with top nutritionists to develop this product. It's got all the whole food sourced ingredients you could like: vitamins, minerals, blah 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 blah. You know the drill. I take it every single day. I suggest you do too. For our listeners, you can get 10 free travel packs when you place your first purchase. Those travel packs are valuable to me. I take them everywhere. Honestly, it's easy. It's convenient. It tastes good. Go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas, A-T-L-A-S, and you'll get with your first subscription, your first order, you'll get 10 free travel packs with your 30-day supply. And trust me when I tell you, this is the only thing you need to take in terms of supplements. People ask me all the time, if you could only take one thing, what would it be? I say athletic greens. I make sure I get all my greens, fruits, vegetables, all 12 servings in one shot. Um, Anyway, Teddy, when I sent it to Mickey, he was nice enough to send me this jacket from the Mickey Ward Apparel Company. And there you go. I know I saw a video of... um, of Tyson Fury wearing the same one. There it is. Mickey Ward, fight of the year, three years in a row. Thanks, Mickey, for the jacket. And when he sent it, Teddy, it reminds me that would make the perfect... And thank you, Ken, for the commercial. Of course. Uh, too. Oh, of course. Yes, I love Mickey. But it reminded me that if you are a fighter or a fight fan and you're going to wear fight-specific apparel... Don't forget to go to Box Raw and check out the 36 collection from Teddy Atlas... There it See is, how he number threw me 36. See how he keeps me in there, my man. You get the Teddy Island I, signature I thought I was on the label. Out. Go ahead. There you go. I wear this when I'm sparring with my children. It's beautiful. Box Raw, the Teddy Atlas collection uh, for all your boxing needs. Uh, Teddy, real quick, for the guys that might... I'm still, I'm still in there with Ken. That's <laughs> how you judge yourself. I'm looking at Sam, who does the great job. Sam Rivera does the great job of filming this every week. And Sam, that's how you know that you still matter. <laughs> that that you still have a chance. Oh, well, well, that's how you know you, you want to hear. That's uh, true. But that's uh, <laughs> but in this case, I thought I might have made it. Maybe I didn't. But <laughs> but that's how you know you're still surviving. You're still relevant. That that Ken keeps you on that list. 
And the list, which, by the way, is growing. I, I just, uh, really, it's along growing by the moment. Along those lines here. I gotta, growing by the moment, baby. I, I got a good one for you along those lines that you'll have a field day with. So sa- last Sunday, I went to the Rams 49ers game. The Friday night before that, I was in Atlanta with my friend Jesse Itzler, who him and his wife, Sarah Blakely, Sarah just sold her company Spanx for a small, a tidy $1.2 billion in cash to Blackstone. Oh, okay. I went. They own part of the Atlanta Hawks. So I went with Jesse to the Atlanta Hawks game, and we literally sat. Did like, they fly you in by? Did they fly in by their jet? I'm just no. Curious but if Jesse was, I know, was, how, you, if Jesse, I know how you travel. Go ahead. <laughs> if Jesse was with me, we probably would have. But I went down there solo. We this sat. I sat one seat from the Celtics bench. Can we, on hey, the floor. Rob? Can we get a commercial? <laughs> can we get a sponsor from Rich and Famous? Remember that show? That guy, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Well, well, listen, listen, with, listen to what happened. So right before the game, we're in like this special, like VIP owners area in the back, and we're talking to. Grant Hill, the great Duke well, where basketball else would you play. Be? Go ahead, I'm sorry. And, and, and Grant Hill looked at me and he goes, hey, you got the show with Teddy Atlas, right? I'm like, yeah, Teddy is. He's like, tell Teddy I said what's up. I love Teddy Atlas. So, okay, cool, definitely will. Go sit on the bench, watch the game. Then in between, at halftime, we go back in there and there's a famous rapper in there. I, I didn't know him, I'm sure my kids do, named Quavos. He's part of a group called Migos. Same exact thing. He goes, hey, you got the show with Teddy Atlas. I said, yeah. That's it, man. He's like, all right, I love the show. So as we're leaving the game, two Atlanta, like, I don't know if they were gangs or what, but this kid Quavos is in a fist fight in the, like, VIP area with another group of kids from Atlanta. It was crazy, but there were cops there and everything. But I just thought it was funny that the two people that we, two, like, super famous people, first thing, hey, you got the show with Teddy Ellis. It's crazy how far the reach is for the show. But sitting on the court that close, to the to an NBA game, you know how it is. I mean, you can hear everything they're saying, hear the coaches telling them what to do in between plays. It was awesome. Thank you to Jesse Itzler and his wife Sarah. Super kind. Um, Teddy, minus four and a half. Rams, Bengals getting four and a half. Basically, even money. Both one, minus one fifteen on both. Who are you taking? I'm taking the points. Um, just like I would take Grand Hill as. Uh, uh, pickup game. I pick him <laughs> home because uh, he could shoot. He could do it all fundamentally, everything. Uh, but, you know, he could get the uh, ball in the basket quick when you had to. And you know what? Joe Burrow can do that. I know I know they're weaker than the Rams on paper. I get it. I get it in certain areas. I do. I mean, obviously, there's a reason why the Sharpies in Vegas, you know, have to line the way they have it. The Sharpies with my bookie have to line the way they have it. But, uh, Joe Burrow, I said it earlier in the show, he's got something magical going on, you know. And uh, magic beats uh, spreads. <laughs> magic beats point spreads. So I I would grab the points, but, you know, we'll see. But who, who do you like? For, do you I'm, ta- I'm taking the points all day. Bengals. I think the Bengals are going to win the game, but at, at plus four and a half, this could easily be a field goal game. Uh, 48 and a half over under. That's interesting. Um, I can never bet the under. You have under. to go with the over. I you can never bet the, the under. When people bet the under, it's like betting the no, like, because don't you're come dead. line. Because under. it's over. <laughs> you're right. It's a, you're dead. It's like, like the uh, second quarter. I'm dead. It's over. I lost. I mean, I got to freaking watch another uh, two and a half quarters of a game, and I did. <laughs> I lost. And then your wife's saying, why are you doing this? Why are you upsetting <laughs> everybody's pleasure here, uh, Ken? Why? Because I lost. Because I lost, and I can't win. And betting, but betting the one me. thing with the un, with the over, you can always like my friend Zeph always says. You know, he he says a couple of smart things. Good friend of mine, very close. Uh, he he says, you know, two things. One, he says, you know, things aren't always complicated. People make them complicated. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's true. And then the other thing. Thing he always says is I only bet overs yeah because you always still have a shot even though sometimes really you don't um, but you, theoretically you do betting the under is like a hot craps table and one joker keeps betting the don't come line and I'm like come on man like it's just such bad energy <laughs> let's keep it going <laughs> Um, all right, we're going to do, guys, for, for, for the fans out there, we're, we're about to do, a, uh, we're going to record a breakdown of the first Whitaker and Israel Adesanya fight. 
That's going to be posted on Thursday for the guys at my bookie, my bookie sponsoring that. And Teddy, before we record that, I've got um, Whitaker for the for my bookie has Whitaker plus two fifteen, Adesanya minus two seventy five. Who do you like? Adesanya. I mean, I think it's going to be tight. I think it's going to be much more competitive this fight because of uh, I, I talked about it a couple shows ago when we were pre-forecasting this a little bit. Uh, Whitaker went compromised into that first fight. I'm taking nothing away from Adesanya. He beat him. He knocked him out. Uh, I think it was in the second round. He caught him with some beautiful counter punches. Uh, Adesanya is the best, one of the best strikers in the UFC. And he, in this fight, he's the better striker. Whitaker's going to have to get his hands on him, if you will, and get him to the mat probably, or at least use his jab, you know, to take away the ability of Whitaker to move and, you know, pot shot and control the outside in a graceful way, the talented way uh, that Adesanya is capable of doing. But I think that the first fight, Whitaker was compromised. He had been sick. Uh, you know, I don't know all the, I don't recall all the exact details, but I know he had a pretty serious uh, ailment uh, to do with his stomach. He, he had to have surgery for it. Uh, he was inactive uh, for, for a good period of time. And then the first fight after that was defending his title against Adesanya and he got knocked out uh he's got a hundred percent health this time he's not dealing with those kind of situations you know that I just talked about and not only was it not only is it fair to probably say he wasn't a hundred percent physically can you know for that fight being that he was coming off that ailment uh but he wasn't, there's no way he could have been 100% mentally right. Yeah. There's no way. When you're going through that, I know, the, <coughs> I know the fight business. I've been in those situations. If your fighter is compromised physically, he's compromised mentally, which is more important because he's not as sure of himself as he normally would be yep. because of what his physical ailment had been. Yeah. And that had to be the case with Whitaker, that he had to be compromised mentally going in. I think this time he's in a much better space, a much better place mentally, physically. I think it's going to be an interesting fight, much tighter fight, but I still can't go against our buddy uh, who's been on our show a couple of times and his trainer. Uh, I, I can't go against him. I think he's one of the most talented if not the most talented fighters, but definitely there's a few very talented guys that do it their own way, kind of like Bruce Lee's, you know, in the in the martial arts business. They do it their own way uh, when they get in that cage. And Adesanya is one of those special guys that his talent, his physical talent is matched by his instinctual abilities. He's got great instincts and he's got a great mind great toughness mentally, great belief as far as he's always going to find a way, he's always going to win. He's only lost that one fight where he stepped up, which was a big step up in weight. You know, he went up to light heavyweight uh, to fight, I think it was Blahovich, right? That's right, yeah, and, um, and Blahovich uh, was just too big. Uh, and, and listen, maybe you could say Adesanya fought the wrong fight because he allowed himself to get into the grips of Blahovich, who wanted him in his grip so he could take him to the mat. Yep. You know, and use his strength and use his great abilities on the mat. Um, but uh, this fight in the middleweight division in the rematch, uh, I'm I'm going I'm going with the guy who's got the belts right now, Adesanya. All right. Well, guys. Stay with us. We'll be is back. Is there an under over on that? Is there an under there over is. on that? Ken? There is. Over under four and a half rounds, minus 125 for the over, minus 105 for the under. So basically, I'm will going it go with the, the over. distance? Yeah, I think I'm it, going with the over, Ken. I think it I'm goes going the with distance the distance as well. Well, listen, I don't know if it'll go the distance, but I think it'll go long enough. Well, well, you you have two and a half minutes in the last in the last round, unless you think it's going to get stopped there. It's going it's going the distance. Um, Let's go break that fight down and record a... No, uh, no, no. It only goes the distance if the bell rings and there's still both guys standing. Yeah, that's, over under is four and a half. half. So you got the last two and a half yeah. minutes. But, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But, yeah. I'm, but 
it's not guaranteed to go the distance. No. Otherwise, there wouldn't be an under-over. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm with you. I'm just saying if you're taking the over, you're pretty much betting that it's going to go the distance. Because the chance I'm of not. it. Oh, you think I it would, might get stopped I, I, in the I last still, two minutes? I, I think it could. I yeah. think, But I just think that gives me enough, enough of a leeway, enough of a cushion um, that... You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the over I, I, again for the same reasons I just explained. Yeah. I think Whitaker is gonna be better mentally and physically this fight. Uh, yeah. But Adesanya is, you know, he's a dangerous counter puncher. Uh, but I think, see, that's the reason why I think it's gonna go over. I think that Whitaker is much more aware now than he was the first time, obviously, of how dangerous this guy is counter punching. And how you can't give him opportunities to use that great, you know, talent. And if and you that see in that, you can't reach. And when you, you see in reach. that first one, he went into like one of those 50 50 exchanges where they both just for a minute, let's just fire. And he got caught, and that was the end of the fight. I think Whitaker well, is going to know better real, than to do that this time. Well, yes. That's, yes, that's what I'm saying. And, and no better in one specific area, not to reach. Yeah. Well, Even let, if you get into a firestorm, do it at the right distance a little bit. Don't throw too many, you know, because you don't want to stay in the middle uh, too long with a counter punch like this. You don't want to stay in that susceptible area. But don't. The main thing, don't reach. Don't throw anything too from too far away. Let's go watch the fight, and we'll break down the first one, and uh, we'll put that up on Thursday, guys. Thanks for being with us. Hope you enjoyed the show. Teddy, thanks for doing this. And we'll be back, like I said, Thursday with the preview or a breakdown of the first Whitaker out of Sanya fight. Thanks Are for you being gonna with be, us. Let me ask you real quick, real quick before yeah. we sign off here. The fans wanted me there. I just got it on my computer. Let me just look. Yeah, People know that I'm jiving with them because uh, I don't even know how to look at the internet. I never have, I don't think. I don't even know. But let me look here. What are the questions from uh, from the fans? Oh, who will Ken be watching the Super Bowl with? Will it be with Goodell? Absolutely uh, Ken? not. Uh, do you remember oh. Deflate Gate? Goodell, you're I, on, oh, my, you're on my crap list. No love okay, for Goodell. That's right, with the... With the footballs with uh, Brady. Witch yeah, hunt. The, that's right. Yeah, witch hunt. It was a witch hunt. Of course it, was it was a witch hunt. Okay. Well, thank you for answering that. Uh, <laughs> to your fans out there, you got your answer. All right. Yeah. Guys, see us on Thursday. We'll be up with the uh, with the fight uh, breakdown from the first Whitaker out of Sanya. 